Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the ELT CPD podcast. In this episode, we're discussing all things IELTS with our IELTS expert, Fatime Lazonzi. Hi, Fatime, how are you? Hi, Billy. So lovely to meet you, finally. <laughs> yes, yeah, so nice to meet you. It's, it's great to have you on, and thanks so much for making time to come and speak to me today. My pleasure. Um, so maybe we can get started by hearing a little bit about yourself, your background, and where you're based, and things like that. Yeah, so I'm an, e an ELT teacher trainer, like a lot of us, a lot of uh, who's probably also listening to us talk about all things IELTS, as you said, and I specialize in teaching soft skills, mm -hmm. especially for teachers who want to become better at uh, preparing students for the IELTS exam. And I think it's important because um, what I notice uh, often is that um, through no fault of their own, teachers tend to test and scold, as I like to call it. So they really um, kind of use past papers a lot and nothing else, or they rely too heavily on course books, and uh, they can be misleading in many ways that we can talk about today as well. Um, so I, I kind of discovered or noticed um, this need for for a bit of a bit more awareness around what teaching skills is, and uh, and how to go about it as well. Perfect. So when did you start teaching and where did you start your teaching journey? Uh, that was longer than I'd like to admit, uh, <laughs> 20 plus years. And uh, yeah, five years in or six years in already, I started teaching IELTS as well. Not just mm -hmm. IELTS, because at the time in Europe, Cambridge exams were just more prevalent in general. Um, but I got approached by students who were already uh, asked by prospective employers abroad. Um, you know, for this particular exam. And like a lot of us, I kind of got into it and I, I tried to figure it out as, as I went with them. And uh, I learned um, a lot of things I, I from their struggles and from my struggles, um, you know, help, trying to help them. Then I taught uh, a lot of candidates in Australia. I was an IELTS coordinator for uh, almost a year mm -hmm. um, in Sydney. And I saw a lot of different struggles on, on various levels with the academic and the general modules as well. And, um, and then I ventured uh, you know, to, to do the Cambridge Delta. Mm -hmm. And I really struggled as a candidate with the skills assignments as many of us do, because it's kind of a, an open secret, I think, that the, the skills LSAs are harder on, on that course. And the reason is the same, that in course books, um, we find a lot of activities that are either just testing the skills um, or are used kind of as a vehicle for um, practicing um, you know, target language, so grammar or vocabulary, or yeah. are used as, as a free practice stage at the end of either a skills or, or, or a systems lesson, or so either after we've taught grammar or vocab or even skills, but you know, not very deeply, not very thoroughly often. So I felt really, really let down um, as a candidate as well, um, because I am super hardworking. I was looking in, in a lot of course books, uh, you know, during the Delta. And uh, and I relied on them and I trusted them. So I thought, you know, if these are published materials, surely they will be good enough for, for my assessors as well. And often they didn't cut it. So I became obsessed with, with skills teaching. And, and, um, and then I also realized that IELTS is so compressed such a short exam compared to other main suite exams um, and 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 it doesn't include any language gymnastics <laughs> so I like to go you know sentence transformation or all the other wonderfully exciting you know I, I love doing them I'm a linguist I speak three languages and they're really really a lot of fun but they take away from the the component of um, of a direct test so IELTS is really as we know all about you know like um, to checking whether you can write through asking you to write this and this and that and the other and and also genres that are really relevant to to a lot of these candidates so that that's, that was kind of another thing I noticed with main suite exams that um, writing a newspaper article or or certain other genres um, narratives and, and other might not be so relevant um, mm -hmm. to a lot the, the candidates that I was meeting who were trying to emigrate or trying to to do a yeah. master's or PhD abroad so that's why the test came into being and that's why I also fell in love with it. You know, Perfect 
that was um, one of our listener questions, actually. How did you get into IELTS, which I think you've um, definitely explained there. I'm going to come back to the relevance later, actually, because you touched on a really important point about some of the relevance of some of the task types there. Um, so I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, but you, you've mentioned a lot of the skills and the sub skills that, that learners need for IELTS and why they're important. Could you sort of outline what these sub skills are, perhaps how they're sort of related to the IELTS as well for teachers, perhaps who don't know the test that well? Yeah. So, yeah. So the word is kind of becoming, you know, more and more common, I hope. <laughs> But we don't always know what we mean by it, and it's it's not so tangible. So that's exactly why teaching skills is is um, a bigger struggle. Besides, you know, the the, the fact that um, I think grammar and vocab is kind of uh, what's also expected culturally. You know, like when uh, stakeholders like parents or schools sign up or, or send their kids to an, an English language course, then in the evening, they might be asking what were the, the new words, what was the new grammar you learned. It's much harder yes. uh, to check uh, or to explain what happened in a in a skills lesson. Um, but what happens in a good skills lesson is that the teacher very consciously examines a micro process. So it just takes one strategy, strategy that they have noticed that they themselves are already using as a native speaker or as a proficient speaker of or user, because it's not only speaking of that language. And we isolate that one minuscule thing, that micro strategy. Um, and then we kind of plan in advance and not on the fly, not improvising during the lesson, that would be too hard. Plan in advance very consciously how we wanna kind of, you know, take our learner through um, the, the, you know, all the ins and outs of that particular strategy in a mm. very, microscopic fashion and always pausing after each step during the lesson to make sure that we are all on board, especially if it's a bigger group um, before we progress on to the next stage. So this all sounds very uh, woo-woo, but, but I, I have seen lessons where um, there is not enough depth, there is mm -hmm. not enough awareness in the teacher's mind as to how they function as a proficient user, how they write an essay, how they go about brainstorming for an essay or how they collect their thoughts for a speaking task, how they gain time when they are lost for words, um, how they use interactive processing in reading. Um, so how they kind of first locate the section in the text that they think the, the, the question might be uh, located in and then go deeper. That's, you know, th these are examples of, of things we do when we, when we are fluent in a language or when we are proficient in the skill as well within that language. Because as we know, native speakers will not necessarily be super fast and efficient readers mm -hmm. or super excellent writers. So really IELTS is, you know, has a reputation for being very, very challenging um, yeah. because it's not just language that it's testing. It's really testing IELTS specific sub skills. And um, that's what I, I love about it. You know, the, the challenging component. <laughs> Absolutely. And do you think that sometimes it's difficult for teachers to teach these skills, as you touched on at the beginning, because the teachers just aren't aware of what they're supposed to be teaching? Like in my own experience, when I started at a language school, I was given my class. I actually focused on sort of like FCE and, and the advanced at the time. But I know as a new teacher, if I was thrown into an IELTS class, I wouldn't know where to start. So do you think that there's perhaps not enough teaching materials to prepare teachers? to teach students for IELTS? There is a lot of past papers, and I know from the teachers that I'm helping or and I'm talking to that they are really heavily relying on that. And that's a safe bet if we are just starting out because, um, you, know, you know, they really give us a clear idea of, of the product and of what the exam entails. Um, and, and we can accompany our students by, you know, if they're just starting out and, and, and they are testing themselves by doing a full reading at home or, or by attempting a full writing at home and they just bring it to class and we tear it into pieces together and we analyze what went wrong. Um, and that's post hoc. So that's really unfair in a way. And that's what, you know, how it becomes testing as opposed to teaching it, which would be, you know, looking at smaller things, not a full listening, not a full, or not a full, not even assigning a full essay, unless it's for a mock or a diagnostic purpose, because we do need to know 
you know, where we stand and where the, where the journey should begin. But beyond that, I think it's a crime to be assigning full essays. Um, if we've already seen that the learner is struggling with this issue, that issue, and, and other, and then we just get them to spend two hours to churn out the same kind of problematic end product. And then we just write the same comments. And yeah, some learners will get, you know, will will benefit from some of that feedback, hopefully, if they are really super motivated, if they're smart enough, if their effective filter doesn't get activated by all this negative feedback. So this is how I, I'm just kind of mindful of how we could do this better. We could just diagnose. And if we see that there is massive issues with coherence and cohesion and task response, for example, um, then maybe we could start by thinking about the types of essays that are that can happen to a candidate on the exam, which is opinion for and against, solution. Uh, what I call the fourth is what I what I call a discursive, which is like a journalistic overview of an of an of a topic, uh, without taking a strong stance, and a hybrid, a combination thereof. So those are the especially tricky ones, where you know, in, in terms of task response, where you have to kind of examine the pros and cons, and then end on a, on on with your own opinion, for example. So becoming or helping them become aware of this and then you know this could be a lesson on its own right and then helping them learn uh, brainstorming skills um in line with with all this uh, subgenre awareness or essay type awareness could be another lesson on its own right or a week if you're learn if it's a big group and if your learners are really struggling so you will know your exact circumstances um but this is teaching. This is uh, not just like, okay, not, you know, band six again, you know, here's another task. Let's hope for the best. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. That's problematic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that goes for every type of teaching, for every exam or non-exam. Um, I think there's a tendency, like you said, to just give a full essay, give them some feedback, hope that they've picked up on that, do another essay. But I totally agree with you. Um, yeah. picking up on those things and then and then working towards doing a full essay rather than doing it the other way around um, yeah. and it leads nicely onto the next question because you were talking about all the sub skills and and I guess perhaps a lot of people might think it takes quite a long time to prepare for the IELTS so what would you say to a student who perhaps comes to your class a month before they want to take the IELTS hoping to get a score of 6.5 or above yeah, it's not impossible. So, you know, we're laughing because we assume that this is a, a, a kind of a joke already, but it doesn't have to be. So there are really a lot of candidates who who find us and they, with three of the four skills, they're already super strong and in, in the ballpark. And then we just show them the exam and, show, and, and, and give them past papers, off you go. So in those cases, you know, learner autonomy plays a huge, huge part as well. It, it it does on all levels, but especially if time is short, especially if they're targeting higher bands. bands. Um, but yeah, I would I would just make sure that we are clear on their general English level first, uh, before I would venture to tell them whether it's possible or not possible, or should they, you know, buy the plane ticket to the end of the world, which <laughs> has often been the case with my candidates. Like. I need an entry now because I need, you know, there is a conditional offer, there is a job waiting, there is a, a scholarship waiting. If I get there before, you know, the end of this month, um, yeah, that's uh, that's very stressful and not really ideal. But if we check their general level and if you see that they are already on a high enough level, then we need to ask whether they've taken the exam before this one or any other. How how did they do on it? What were the, the results? Um, where, where were the weaknesses? What have they tried, if anything? Um, how autonomous are they? How ready are they to invest time and energy, um, mental energy as well? So that, that's really something that we need to highlight on, on short, so short notice, that it's not just like, yeah, I'm going to spend 10 hours just doing this, but will you have the bandwidth? I have seen can just become so mentally saturated you know who who did allocate three weeks because they were in such a hurry because of a deadline and and just couldn't you know after the second essay of the day and this, then they did another reading and then they didn't know whether they were coming or going anymore so so that's um something to be responsible about but invite them to kind of be responsible as well it's not only on us uh, as we know 
Um, and then, and then also to kind of check whether they're already actively reading, listening, writing, speaking in mm -hmm. English. And which of these could they, you know, be doing just as a lifestyle? Uh, how much of it are they already doing? Are they listening to podcasts, YouTube? Um, are they? What are they writing, if anything? That that's generally a, a problem with writing in particular, which is famously the hardest skill of the four for all nationalities. So it's not an L one interference question. And the reason probably is this, that many people just don't write in their everyday lives. And um, how can we introduce it? Although, you know, if it's such an ASAP situation, uh, it might be a bit too late for that to, to kind of generate the, the fluidity and the confidence and the, um, but yeah, it, it, you know, if it's a, maybe a, a longer course, then it's a good idea to just start encouraging these things that are skills-based, but are not about academic topics. So I am listening to a long podcast. I have to concentrate. I have to understand, but I'm not answering questions yet. It's on a topic that I chose. Therefore, I'm more interested. Chances are, ideally. So uh, that's kind of a good scaffold, uh, an authentic scaffold in the system. But again, it requires time. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good idea, actually, especially with the writing, like you said, because from my own experience, like a lot of students just don't like writing. <laughs> like you said, if they don't do it in their everyday lives, they also don't really see the relevance and the purpose. Um, and I guess that does take us back to the relevance, I guess, dissecting the IELTS itself. Would you say that a lot of the task types, whether academic or general, are still relevant and, and they that they test skills that students will use in their in their real world as well? Yeah, so there is a distinction between the general module and the academic, and um, I'm more geared towards helping teachers working with academic students because yeah. that's just my experience that most candidates are after the academic mm -hmm. uh, exam in my in my context or that, that uh, tended to be the case. But um, yeah, so about the, the academic context, we do know that they will have to read, they will have to be confident and fluent in their um, ability to use interactive processing, whether you know, in the receptive skills, whether reading or listening. Um, they will listen to things, they will have to take note uh, in, a, in a, a much freer fashion, actually. So this is kind of like a kindergarten level compared to, you know, doing a, a master's or a PhD where, you know, the information is, is, is kind of being poured all over you and it's not, you're not only taking down keywords and under, trying to catch keywords, but you're also kind of building your notes yeah. uh, from scratch. So that's an, an even harder skill. So this is why when there is this you know, debate around how valid IELTS is for, for pre-EAP or EAP, I think it really is valid as an entry um, thing and as an entry product because things are only going to get harder uh, with real EAP. So... Mm. Uh, where, where you need to use integrated skills as well, where you need to read much longer and you need to read multiple sources and then then you write and condense and you form an op opinion or, or your... So that's really integrated. IELTS isn't integrated really, mm. um, you know, thank God <laughs> in a way. So uh, there are integrated skills exams on the market in other language exams. I took... Um, uh, the the Dele Superior, the Spanish C2 level exam, that okay. was much harder than the Cambridge Proficiency or even IELTS because that is a really integrated exam. So you you listen, you then you write based on what you heard, and if you didn't wow. take proper notes, then tough luck. So you know, for people who are really kind of afraid of IELTS, it could be worse. <laughs> That's a so. really, really, really key point, I think, because people assume that IELTS is so overwhelming. You know, the listenings are really long, the readings are really long, and there's a lot of parts to each paper as well. But like you said, perhaps compared to other tests, not so much. Would you say then it's a good idea to show your learners other tests if they do have a bit of a fear of it? Have you ever thought? No, I think they would. Well, that's a good question. Would they get confused? Is it relevant? What? How short a notice are we working on? If it's three three weeks from now, obviously we don't we don't want to distract them with uh, other you know ideas or they're already scared. <laughs> Usually yeah. they're already really doing the work for you know for for the most part in my experience. So um, and if they're not learning other languages, it would be even quite hard to 
show them a test paper in another language and 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 it's just you know among linguists or among language teachers it's just good to be aware of this and uh, and and not just you know compare IELTS to other languages and other language exams but the real to real EAP which mm -hmm. is what they are after and which is what they will be doing in a lot of cases um, mm -hmm. I think that's more relevant often uh, mm -hmm. for their purposes and for their future definitely um, and what advice would you give to teachers who are new to teaching IELTS perhaps someone who's listening who's just newly qualified they've done their CELTA or perhaps their DELTA and they're, and they're looking to to teach yeah um don't believe everything that's in a course book um I mean it's a good scaffold it's a good uh starting point and what you will likely see is CELTA level um materials in a in a way so there is always a, an end kind of a gist question and then boom you see the the, the actual questions as if it was the real test or yeah. a, I, I've been administering a past paper so in that sense it's not really a scaffolded enough product between um you know taking the real thing and just because we threw some lead-in questions to activate their schemata of the topic it's not gonna teach the skill itself um, yeah. without our help so what they could do is to kind of become a bit more skeptical observe um, observe their own uh, processes and try to see whether they can scaffold the course book a bit so if they notice too big a jump knowing mm -hmm. their own learners between exercise one and two um, then just devise some ways uh, Th trying to think what a proficient and, and fluent user of the language would do to get to the goal that the exercise two is asking me to do and how could I break it down further break it down to, uh, to make it more manageable and then write guiding questions after each micro stage just you know not not only to walk them through stuff um, but to also kind of recap like what just happened and and, and you know was it useful? Why, why not? What will you do differently next time when you write an essay? So to kind of do this uh, meta work uh, as well. And um, and then check if some of the sub-skills that are available in the learners L1 could be borrowed and could be built upon and, and also be very mindful when they cannot. So mm -hmm. uh, famously, and in, in, again, we keep returning to writing because that's so hard and one of the difficulties is that um, genres can be really different across cultures so okay. let, we just need to be very mindful whether we can take it for granted that they will know what an, es an essay is yeah. supposed to be like in terms of the target audience the communicative purpose the layout uh, expectations paragraphing uh, so but things that we might take for granted in, in our culture, in our mother tongue, might not at all be so obvious. That's really true. How would you tackle that in a multilingual class? Because obviously, if you've got different cultures and maybe perhaps you're not familiar with one or the other, how, how would you approach that, do you think? That's a very important question because a lot of contexts are mixed. Um, and and we might not know our learners' mother tongue enough, and and we, we're just facing the problems where we don't know where they are coming from, and you know we don't even need to kind of know, but instead we can always rely on comparative analysis and and a guided discovery kind of no you know to get them to notice stuff before we ask them to to do stuff is <laughs> is usually a good rule of thumb in my experience. So showing them like you know a less successful essay and maybe a more successful one and then asking guided questions written in advance um like in, in terms of who are we talking to how clear is it um is the language always appropriate and then you know include a lot of informal or slang or even rude or offensive uh, words in in the less successful example and just get them to notice before uh, we ask them to produce is generally important and that can be done um, even in a mixed uh, classroom I think yeah. yeah that's a really good idea because then you can elicit their knowledge and, and what they know and what gaps they have in that knowledge so say half of the class realize that perhaps it's the wrong register let's say 
and the other half of the class are not really sure, then you know to sort of focus on that, I guess. So that's really, really important. It's like eliciting their existing knowledge, isn't it? To help yeah. you as a teacher prepare. So Yeah, exactly. And and increasing learner autonomy, create, you know, this is a genuine communication gap. You know, we, we work so hard to create info gap activities. This is, yeah. is a real one, like to talk to your partner who might actually uh, be coming from a different culture. So their idea about this might be closer to what is expected in English and on IELTS in particular. And um, yeah, well, I was going to say something about this as well. What was it? Um, that we need to really always pin things down before we move on. So yeah, talk to your partner and okay, now moving on. But they often, as a learner, I, I definitely was like this. I needed confirmation from the teacher. Um, and I, 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 you know, just because we discussed something, but nothing kind of got pinned down that this is the correct way forward. Um, then I felt safe to go on to the next stage and to even produce and to start you know, writing on my own. But I think this is often missing because again, we assume that they did exercise one, they got to talk and and maybe they got to talk, they discussed something and they didn't draw conclusions. They're more confused than before. And now we're on to exercise two already. That's not ideal. Why do you think materials aren't made with that gap in mind between like the gist activity and the comprehension activity? Why do you think if sort of you think of this as a teacher and if we're encouraging teachers to do this, why don't they just include it in the materials? Yeah, oh, that's, this is a dangerous question. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, if not everybody who writes materials has the, the, the Cambridge Delta or, or, a, or an MA in materials design simply because these are difficult courses, they're expensive, they're long, there, there isn't enough of them. So when, when somebody's considering an MA, um, now things are more available online, but maybe they weren't so readily available five years ago, 10 years ago, when a lot of uh, IELTS course books were also written that we're still teaching from today. Um, so true, yeah. Yeah, so that, and then just, um, well, yeah, that's not answering this question. I was just also thinking about how there is a lack of awareness of the problem in general on the market around teaching skills and how problematic it is and how, what the current state of skills teaching is. And I think it's partly because on entry level qualifications, we accidentally give the wrong idea mm. that you are not a teacher, uh, you know, and off you go and you're done and, and good luck and keep on running you know, gist and, you know, like leading and then pre-teaching vocabulary, which I especially disagree with, then a gist task, then, you know, what were the correct answers, then a deep, then a detailed answer question, and then some free practice, and off we go, and that's, um, we'll call that a reading lesson or a listening lesson, and, and we think we are teaching skills, so there is something to do with, with that misunderstanding that, that yeah. there isn't life above and beyond uh, like the, the entry level, which is super important. I have the Cambridge Celta. I needed to have this, these scratches, uh, crutches, sorry, to go into a classroom confidently and to be able to run a lesson. And the learners got a lot out of it. So they got to read something, they learned, picked up vocabulary, whatever, uh, uh, you know, was in the book uh, officially, as, as, as the aim, but we know that learners will learn other things that are not officially the aim of the lesson. And, um, that, that all happens. And yet, um, if, you know, if you want to actually learn skills teaching that is very sharp, very, you know, pulling the strands apart, focusing on one strand at a time, taking that very deep, uh, dedicating, ded dedicating the whole lesson to that, not just because practically that's what learners will likely need but this will also kind of help them notice um just how sloppy it is not to go so deep and and to just keep on writing bad essays and hoping for better results and hoping for better feedback from my teacher yeah um, yeah and you've written materials is that right yes yeah. i worked with, yeah not yeah. just for i mm -hmm. And with IELTS materials, if because we have a lot of um, uh, listeners to the podcast who are writers and editors as well. So what would be sort of your top authoring tips to create 
really useful IELTS materials because that's yeah. hopefully what we're going to achieve by this podcast. <laughs> that's an amazing question because uh, as we know that you know people are creating their own materials they always did we always created our worksheets uh, but there is more and more of this and, and I am loving how um, other than this benefiting our learners, this is helping teachers not burn out and, and, and put yeah. their creativity to good use. So uh, it's it's amazing to see this happening. And uh, yeah, and it requires some skill, some awareness. Um, so, you know, it's useful to take courses, uh, either the ones I mentioned or or uh, Kath Bittlesborough's upcoming course or, or you know, other options. Um, and beyond that, you know, choose your own favorite topic. So the, the books that I have written, um, people who know me in my private life, they know that certain topics are my hobby horses yeah. and they keep on resurfacing in my materials because I'm fascinated by them. I love researching them. I loved writing the, about them and then writing the questions to go with them. I kept myself entertained and it's a win-win. So I think, um, you know, as long as those topics are ostensibly relevant enough but anything goes because you know even even for the academic you can kind of look at the same topic that you're fascinated by from an academic angle and just research that and then write around that and don't grade your vocabulary too much because you know we normally with other you know systems teaching materials grammar or vocab or we we, we have to be super mindful of um even using tools you know the the global scale and, and other uh, writing tools to make sure that we don't include items, lexical items or other that are beyond the, the target level. This doesn't quite apply to IELTS because it's a, a zero to nine band uh, uh, exam as we know. So, you, you know, you don't wanna get too carried away and, and, and write too technical, but even that can be justified if the code text is thorough enough, if the questions were written in a way uh, that a, a native speaker, a fluent speaker or user could answer them. So the, I, on my blog uh, that people listening can find at www.fatimelosonsi.com, um, I have one entry about this. I think it's titled, um, do learners need, do IELTS learners need to know much about rocket science or something? Because the idea is that, you know, and it's demonstrated there is a worksheet on, on my website if you, if they want to find, look for it. Um, the, the whole text is about rockets and physics and 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 yet it's doable because the you know the questions it's a um, the questions are, are kind of keyword search and then even if you don't quite know what's happening in the text you you can zoom in on um, on those questions and and uh, that's the skill. So really this is how it's a skills exam. It's not like do you know all the words there is to do with physics and architecture, archaeology, psychology, you know, academic subjects galore that can come up in, in IELTS. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the common misconceptions, isn't it? Students going into it think, oh, I don't know about these topics, you know, but you don't need any pre-existing knowledge. It is a skills test. You're 100% right. It's all about time management as well, because like we said, the reading texts are quite long, listening texts are quite long. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. focusing on those skills rather than just read the text and find the words you know as as an untrained teacher or a teacher just thrown into an IELTS um, class would perhaps do as well so it's really really useful um you mentioned your blog is there any other way that that people can contact you or perhaps find out more about the work that you do yeah so uh, my website is www.fatimelosonsi.com um and on on, on, on my homepage, there's also a masterclass uh, where I talk a bit more in depth about what teaching skills is about. This is free for now um, to just um, to watch and, and enjoy and take notes on. And um, that's one kind of idea that people interested could do now. They can also follow me on LinkedIn. I'm hyperactive on LinkedIn. And all the things that I post there tend to end up in my blog. So if people wanna kind of see what I have written, but there are like 250 plus entries wow. on my blog already around sub skills for IELTS for the most part. And so I really recommend kind of checking that out. 
um, yeah, more to come. There will be a newsletter at some point. <laughs> there, I, I have started uploading things onto YouTube. Um, nice. That hopefully will grow. But you know, as you know, believe you know, it's a one woman show or a one person show. So you know, this is a big shift in our industry. And 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 students and teachers, when there is a hunger for something, they would like more. And and they don't realize that you know, I'm not. A, you aren't either. And many of us aren't. A, 500 or 1000 person publishing house um but but um, are trying to kind of cover our basis and and i am focusing on linkedin and on my blog and i really recommend people watch the master class on my website perfect thank you very much and thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise i feel like we could chat for hours and still not get scratched the surface of the skills in our health um but thank you so much for your time and um i'll put a link to your blog and to the master class as well for, for anyone who wants to um to watch that as well i know i definitely will be watching it because it sounds super interesting um so thanks to everyone for listening and if you have any other burning eye outs questions as we said please do feel free to get in touch with Fatima or search for her on her website or linkedin and don't forget to follow the show on instagram and linkedin eltcpd for when the next episode goes live as well thanks everyone mm-hmm.